Hey everybody, thanks for stopping by the Curiosity Theory Hangout. It's a podcast that challenges men and women to live inspired lives and positively impact the world. My name is Martin Lopez, and I'm the guy that high performers, entrepreneurs, and leaders call when they're looking to shift, when they're looking to change something. They call me when they're looking to pivot back into the, what I call the positive, what they call the positive. I'm known as a master coach. I'm also an author and a father of two amazing boys, and I'm also a business owner. I'm just a regular guy just like you. Uh, I work every day to meet life's challenges. I'm committed to living the greatest version of me and inspiring you to do the same. On this podcast, we address real life challenges, and then we're going to deconstruct the methodology and the pathways to success. I'm using a technology that I call, let me find my book, I call the curiosity theory. And my wonderful guests, they bring their talents. They bring their amazing gifts. Uh, today, today's guest is Kristen Siggins. She's the author of this amazing book that I have all marked up. It's called The Power of Curiosity, How to Have Real Conversations uh, That Create Collaboration. I love this innovation and understanding. Those are three powerful human needs. I love human needs. She calls them uh, value. Uh, values. Well, she'll talk about it in a second. She's the co-founder in, in, of the Institute of Curiosity, along with her mother, Kathy. She's a TED Talk speaker, and her TED Talks is really, really good. You got to listen to it. Um, she's married. She's a mother of two. And in the TED Talk, she talks about her three-year-old son uh, and his pants. I'm going to see if she'll tell, tell us the story when she when she jumps on. Uh, like I said, my book is all marked up. And let's bring Kristen in. Let's talk about curiosity. How you doing, Kristen? I'm great. How are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm so grateful that we were finally able to meet. I know that you, you had some stuff going on and and uh, scheduling all that. It's, I'm so happy to be here. It's a pleasure. That's cool. That's cool. So uh, real quick, a little bit about you. You live in, where do you live again? Kelowna. I'm in Kelowna, BC. What's that like? Uh, today it's gorgeous and beautiful. It's still a little cold, but it's stunning here. It's stunning. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, um, you know, how about we start with the story the story you talk about in TED Talks about your son. I just love that story. Oh, my gosh. You're a parent. Any parent out there can completely relate to this story. He was three years old. It was early in the morning. I was, you know, I had one foot out the door, right, trying to get to work. And I had to get him to preschool. And I realized, you know, I was like, we're late. We're late. We got to go. We got to go. And I thought he was dressed and ready. And all of a sudden, I see him and he has no pants on. And so I said to him, where are your pants? And he, he's like, I, I need my pants from yesterday. And I said, your pants from yesterday are dirty. Can you please pick another pair of pants? We need to go. And he's like, no, I need my pants from yesterday. So, you know, immediately I go into, okay, I can do this. I get down on his level. I look him in the eye. And I'm I a good say, communicator. Right? I can do this. Like, <laughs> I feel like you're not hearing me. So what I'm saying is your pants are dirty. Can you please pick another pair, pair of pants? Because we got to go. Well, yeah. I mean, he like literally turned into the Hulk. He burst into tears. He oh. became hysterical, snot streaming down his face. And he's screaming at me. He's like, I want my pants. I want my pants from yesterday. So I'm proud parenting moment. I turn on my heel. I go into the laundry room, pull out the dirty pants. And I sort of shove them his way. I'm like, here, where are the dirty pants? You got to go. <laughs> tell you what, dirty pants. Here you go. So I know. Like, be that kid. <laughs> It's awful. I, I feel so bad even think going telling the story. I tell it all the time. But anyway, he grabs the pants, pulls out a toy, hands me back at the pants, and through his snotty tears, he's like, Here, like I watched him put on a fresh pair. And he's like, Okay, mom, we can go. Oh. And I literally wanted the world to swallow me whole. And so I immediately said, like, what can I do so this never happens again? I I mean, obviously you wanted your pants for the toy, you didn't want to wear your pants. And he was like, you could have just asked me. And I thought, here's my three-year-old schooling me in curiosity, right? Like the power of asking questions. And yeah. in that moment, I was so focused on my own needs. I was so focused in my own head and like getting out the door and what I needed to do and getting to work and that ticker tape that parents have. I was not paying attention to him and his needs. I was not present to what he needed. And I did not ask the question. And if I had just asked the question, how come you want your pants? He would have told me the toy and we would have been out the door probably on time with our relationship intact, right? No emotional breakdown. But it is, yeah, it's a powerful story. I learned a lot from it. I share that story with parents all the time. It brings some parents to tears because everybody can relate. We've all had those moments. We all have that. Yeah, we have that. I have two boys and 
countless times where they their their thoughts were in one place and my thoughts were another and just because I'm the I'm the dad I my, you know my my rules rule and and you know when if I would have stopped and asked them what they would what they were what they what they needed I uh, probably things would have probably changed and been a lot different. I love that. I love that story. It really, it's, it's so, it's just so common. It's something that happens. You, you talk about 90% of our conversations are unheard and that's one of those 90%, right? Yes, they are. That's yeah. research out of Stanford. Yeah. They said 90% of conversations miss the mark. It's kind of, it's kind of insane when you think about it, but it's not that crazy also when you think about it, because in order for a conversation to land, you have to have a lot of components. One of them is we need to be present to your yes. point and yes. focusing on the person we're speaking to. And most of us are not present in our life. You know, we're, there's so many factors that are competing with our presence nowadays. And we're also fo focused inward on what's going on in our head and our thinking yeah. and our to-do list and our ticker tape. We're not focused outward on listening to the other person. So it it is an eye-opening statistic. And it also makes a lot of sense when you think about it. You're like, yeah, 90% of our conversations suck. I love it. The ticker tape. I, that's such a, a brilliant way to, to talk about that. It's just the, that's the, so is the ticker tape, is that the, is that just the constant stream of thoughts? Is that what you mean by that? For me? Yeah. It's that constant stream of thinking, how am I going to react listening to, you know, insert myself, fixing, solving problems. You know, you know how we get where we get focused on our thoughts and our and our little, you know, gremlin inside. We use that in the book, the gremlin voice, right? Because yeah. it gets in the way. But for me, it feels like a ticker tape. It's this constant noise that you have to literally be present to so you can turn it down 100%. to give the person you're talking to your your full attention. That's really great. And so you you and your mom, you go into who do you guys work with? What 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 population? So, my, just to be clear, my mom and I wrote the book together. She's my business partner, which always gets a gasp, right? People are like, oh, you work with your mother. Um, <laughs> but I like to think that it, it speaks to the success of our skills, which sure. is, you know, communication skills, effective conversation skills. So we work with entrepreneurs and professionals, and I am passionate about working with parents because, mm. you know, parenting skills are like communication skills were not taught. And I thought I was an amazing parent until I had kids. And then it became clear that I didn't know anything about parenting. <laughs> and it became clear that I was not a great communicator as I, you know, the example I shared with my son at three. Um, and, and so I, I quickly learned like, we're not taught these skills and our kids do what we do, right? And so if I want my kid to learn how to have conversations and I want my kid to learn how to manage emotions and do all the necessary things to be successful in life. Nobody is going to teach him. Nobody taught yeah. me. Nobody teaches my clients, right? So for me, it's I'm really passionate about working with parents because I feel like I love working in the professional setting with entrepreneurs and professionals, but they all say, like, I wish I learned this stuff a long time ago. Yeah. Right? It's yes. like, okay, well, then let's get in front of the eight ball and start earlier. Yes. If you had to say, and, and I want to get back to that, and, but my thought is, is because I love the title, The Power of Curiosity. If you had to sum up the power of curiosity, what would you say the power is of curiosity? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think for me, like the power is that you, you can, uh, how do I explain? Nobody's ever asked me that. I think the power really comes down to the fact that when you're curious, you can stay calm in a conversation, yeah. you engage in relationships. You can control your emotions. I mean, curiosity really is the root of all of those things of being human, right? Because it allows us to see, hear, and understand others. And it allows us to see, hear, and understand ourselves. And yes. that is like, that's what curiosity allows us to do. And that's where the power comes from. When you can see, hear, and, somebody, see, hear, and understand somebody, that's how you build connection. That's how you're able to, you know, have those incredible relationships, have hard conversations without reacting and exploding because we're open to listening and understanding doesn't mean we have to like and agree with mm -hmm. but when there's understanding there's no conflict it's the same thing that self-awareness journey curiosity allows you to you know understand yourself so your your values your needs those all contribute to your emotional triggers so when we have a better understanding of self it's easier to have a better understanding of other and that's where you build those incredible connections, you know, whether it's professionally or personally, and you cannot do that without curiosity. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, you know, for me, when I think about that, I would think you can't do it without curiosity because what you're doing is you just, you're just using strategies and the strategies have to fit. 
uh, yeah, there, there's no room to like say, well, which one, which one should I use? It's always like part of the equation. Yeah. You know? Otherwise you're just, it's a, otherwise it's just an algorithm and it's automatic, which is, that's where we get in trouble, right? That's where we get in trouble in the automatic responses and the reactions. Autopilot. Yes, that's exactly oh. it. Yeah. We yeah. just, we go into autopilot. We're completely reactive. We're not open to anything else. You know, but we don't live in a world that allows us to be on autopilot anymore. I don't know that we ever did, but we especially don't live in that world now. You know, we can't presume to know anybody's experience. We don't know what the future holds. Parents, for the first time, were parenting blind with the pandemic and technology. We didn't have those things growing up. Our parents certainly didn't, right? So we're flying blind. Leaders are pivoting in their business like never before. They don't know what's coming down the pipeline. So we can't stay in autopilot. We can't say, oh, this is how we do stuff. Curiosity has to be at the root of everything we do because we have to be able to say, okay, well, what can we do? How can we pivot? What's going to change? Everybody hates that word now, pivot. It's one of those pandemic words that they want to eliminate from the vocabulary. Yeah. But it, it's just, it is what it is, right? Like that's what curiosity helps us do. It helps us make those shifts in the moment so that we can accommodate our businesses, our clients, our relationships, whatever it may be. It's super that. important. That's great. That's a funny thing. I just started using the word pivot. <laughs> oh, <did you? laughs> I just, I, I think I'm a, a late bloomer or something. Yeah. It just, but it just seemed to work that, that um, it is a, uh, it is, it is what we're looking for is we're looking to, for that change, for that shift, for that pivot. You know, it's a, it's a very, very powerful word and it may have been u- overused. It still has, this definitely still has this application. Where are you finding the, your, your uh, entrepreneurs and your small business owners, where are you finding their, um, their pivot points are and what are they pivoting toward? Well, it's a couple, it's a whole bunch of different things. I think for, you know, small business owners or even medium, larger business owners, they're really, it's figuring out, okay, how are we going to do business moving forward? Are people going to come back to the office? Do people want to come back to the office? And then of course, these two years when people have been doing everything virtually their and their needs have changed, right? So some people don't want to travel anymore. Some people now have families and they can't do the job the way they did, you know, so that going back to that curiosity, It's so important to be able to ask those questions and find out what the needs are of their clients and what the needs are of their employees, because a lot has happened. Big changes have taken place in the last two years. And so it's figuring out how, what do we need to move our business forward and what do our clients and our our employees need, you know, for themselves as well. 100%. 100%. I'm finding that a lot of companies are using the metric system, you know, using metrics a lot more and looking at productivity and looking at, you know, participation and all those different, uh, you know, different measures. Because when, when they were saying when, you know, when everybody was in the office, there was a lot of downtime where people were socializing. They don't have a problem with that, but they were, but they, they look at the, the at the accountability now and a lot of their numbers are, are way better. So they're concerned, like if we have everybody go back, What's going to happen? What's going to happen? How how is that going to be a culture shift? People getting used to hanging out with each other, and uh, and then you know power struggles, and and you know hurt feelings, and you know old, old maybe old scars and stuff. You know, there's just a lot of different things to address. Are you finding that something that you're running into as well? Well, I think it's really yeah, it's business specific. I mean, different businesses and different people and different employees want different things, and so that's why I, I don't believe there's a one size fit all. If it's all yeah. you know solution for this, I think it really comes down to the culture that these businesses want to create, and so it's it's checking in with your employees and understanding what are our values, what do we stand for as a business, you know, and and then it's also. What do our employees need? What do they want? How do they maximize their productivity? Because I think we've shown that they're, we don't, we can't do, we can do it a whole bunch of different ways and doing it that one old way in the office, you know, we've shown the last two years, there's a lot of different ways that we can do it. So yeah, I like that. Really, you no, know, yeah. everybody's different. Every business needs are different, but until you have those curious conversations, you are not going to be able to move forward in a way that's effective for your business because it's a conversation that involves everybody. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I, I think we, you know, the old way was, you know, I'm the boss. I'm the one that writes the paycheck. I'm the one that hired you. So we're going to do it my way. And then back then, what was the, you know, the, the participation, like the, it was 35%, 40% if you're lucky, right? 70% of, of workers are, are, are not even happy in the job or, and half of those people are, are on a daily basis looking for other jobs. So there's just so much that was happening. And, 
And now we have a whole new culture of like, all right, now you're uh, you as a worker now important. And that also requires the leadership to, to be able to manage that. Or, or how, how would you say that be able to, uh, facilitate, you know, other people being important, facilitate those conversations that, you know, their version of being a boss has shifted. Their version of being a, a manager of being a leader has shifted as well. And they've got to learn as well. Yeah. And that can be, that can be hard for a lot of people. I mean, as the saying goes, people don't leave bad jobs. They be, leave bad leaders. Mm. And, and so there's, and it's hard because, you know, depending on the work that you're doing, at least in our experience, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're really good at what you do, but that doesn't mean that you know how to lead teams and manage people. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a hard, interesting time, but that's where the power of curiosity. I mean, that really is people's superpower. If they can stay in that play of, place of curiosity to see, hear, and understand the needs of others, you know, their employees and their clients, because the client's needs have most likely changed as well. Mm -hmm. That's really where, you know, they're going to sing. I love it. Seek, hear, and understand. Yeah. That's, that's our it. foundation. That's what we believe all humans want. They want to be seen, heard, and understood. I love that. I'm going to start using that. I hope you don't mind. Not at I, all. I will definitely, you know, it, it there's a there's a, a culture shift not only in in um like in corporations and in you know small business but there's a, I, I, it feels like there's a culture shift in just the being you know like how you know with this whole thing with 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 Musk and how people are you know Elon Musk buying Twitter and how people are upset but some people are really excited and 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 there's you know I, I I'm hope my hopes are is that is that we come together in some type of ability to disagree. And at the same time to be able to work together because we don't have to always agree to work together and we don't always have to feel super, super yummy in order to feel, to, you know, in order to get things done. What are your thoughts about that? I, I, I personally don't think that um, I'm of the belief that conflict is good. Mm -hmm. I, I actually like conflict because I, and I think it's necessary in our relationships and I think it's necessary in everything that we do because it's bringing different perspectives. I think it's how we manage and we deal with conflict that creates the issues. So having different perspectives and listening to different sides of the tables and experience, it is, in my opinion, the most essential skill that we can develop because that is the world in which we're going into. That's mm -hmm. how you collaborate and that's how you innovate, right? And mm -hmm. there's nobody on this planet that can understand, you know, we, there's no one way to do anything because we're all sort of living in this yes. new world, right? That yeah. nobody knows anything about. <laughs> so we have to be able to have these hard conversations. We have to be able to listen to different perspectives. We have to be able to understand different experiences take in all of those data points and then say, okay, now that we know all of this, like how do we want to move forward? Or if you're in a conversation where you hear something that you don't like, it's being able to stay in that place of curiosity where you can still focus outward to see here and understand the person you're talking to so that you can understand what it is that they're going through. I am not saying you have to like what they hear and mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you have to agree with what they hear. And I think people often confuse that Yes. Right. It's like yeah. in order to be friends or in order to be comrades or colleagues, we all have to be on the same page. You can still understand somebody and their experience and not agree with what they're saying, but you can still understand what they're saying. So you can move forward in a way that makes the most sense for your business or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, or even for yourself, if you have friends or loved ones that have conflicting opinions, you can still be friends with them and you can yeah. still love them. We just need to understand where they're coming from. And, and when we learn that when you have understanding, there can't be conflict, it's a lot easier, right? But you have to be able to stay in that place of being open to listen and understand to do that. I love it. And, you know, as, I'm, as, I, as you're saying that, I'm thinking that, that one of the hardest things to do is to listen to another person that does not have your opinion and then to be able to listen to their opinion in a way that you can, that you can be respectful that you can be open, that you can actually get their opinion without, for me, like, this is my thing, without them thinking that I, that I'm agreeing with their opinion and that, that, because what happens I've noticed is that people will say, well, you, well, you listened, like, so you agreed. It's, there's this, there's that fine line. Like, how do you, is there a way that you, you go about that? Uh, and let me kind of say a little bit more about that. So then what, what happens for me, I noticed in the past, it's less now. But, um, you know, that, that 
they're like, well, you know, you listen to what I said. So, so you agreed with it. Right. And I'm like, I, when I didn't agree with, it, I was, I was being respectful and listening. So it's like, how do you, how do you manage that part? Is there a methodology that you guys teach to manage that? The, so the listening part or the agreeing part or both? <laughs> I, th I think it's the whole thing. You know, let's say it's the result of doing that. Like, so, so you and I having a conversation and you say, yeah. you know, I like, you know, I like, you know, you know, green grapes. And I like, oh, that's really, really great. And I don't even like grapes. And I'm listening to you talking grapes. And then so the next day you bring all these grapes over and I'm like, I don't like grapes. You were just, tell, you know, you were just telling me that you like the grapes. So even in, this is even in um, good listening, there's, there can be miscommunication. Does, does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And, you know, I guess what I'm hearing, so how, one of the tricky things about this is that we can't change other people's behavior, mm -hmm. right? We can only yeah. control how we show up. We can't control how other people show up. So when you're listening and we call it listening to learn, right? So essentially what I'm hearing you say is when, if somebody says to me, I like green grapes and you're like, Oh yeah, okay, that's great. I'm listening to understand what's going on for them. But to your point, they're processing the information because I'm saying I'm listening as they're processing it through their own lens and their own experience. And so they're saying, oh, they're nodding. Therefore, they like green grapes. There you go. Yeah, that's that little that little twist that, 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 that people get caught up in. So keep going, please. Thank you. Right. So they're processing the information through their own lens and experience. And they're saying, okay, now you like green grapes. And they bring green grapes. When you show up with green grapes, you know, it's like, here, I brought you green grapes because I know you love them. Because you said, like, because you said you, you like said them. You love them, right? And it's like, <laughs> wait, I didn't say I love them. Like, yes, you did. You nodded your head. You know, yeah. but they, most people wouldn't even say the nod head. They're just yeah. like, no, you said you like them. And that's where conflict starts, right? Yes. If you can stay in that place of curiosity, say, oh, when did I say that I liked, you know, green grapes? Or what made you think I like green grapes? Well, when I said I like them, you nodded your head. You said, yeah, I, I, I was just confirming. I heard what you said. I actually don't like green grapes. I like whatever. But what happens is we're taught to communicate. We're taught to listen, to be experts, to be fixers and solvers, right? Most of us have been taught to listen, to insert ourselves into a conversation, mm -hmm. to be the expert, because that's just what's been modeled to us. Very few people have ever been taught how to listen, to understand. In fact, we work with negotiators. We work with professional listeners who will say that to us. They'll say, when I put on my you know, professional hat, I know what I'm supposed to do. But the moment I get home, I'm not listening to anybody, right? So it, we, we take our best work and we bring our leftovers home is how we, <laughs> how we do it. Yeah. Because we're not taught those skills. So it's having the intention going into a conversation to be present. Yeah turning down the little voice in your head, right? And focusing outward so that we can understand what's going on for the speaker and we can listen to understand what's going on for them. Now, if somebody comes back to you and says, well, you said you liked whatever, you can stay in that place of curiosity and say, oh, what makes you think that? Or how, what did I, how did I show you that? Cause that's interesting. Yeah. You're gonna get the understanding from the other person and the more that you understand, the easier it is to have those harder conversations because you can't have conflict with understanding, right? It's going to be, oh, well, you nodded. Oh, that's funny. That's not what I meant. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. it's staying out of that. It's staying out of our inward, focusing inward. I say like when we're focused on ourselves and we're focused inward, we can't understand others because we're listening to the thoughts yeah. in our head. We're I'm listening all right to our here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're all there. What am I going to say next? How am I going to be funny? How am I going to fix and solve this problem? <laughs> And the other person <laughs> probably isn't wanting to be fixed and solved. There's probably yeah. no problem, right? It's just we like to listen through our own lens and our own experience, and it creates conflict. And it and people feel judged. Yes, and and, and so I, I thank you. This is thanks for for being so great about that because I was able to work through something as you were talking, and it's been something that I've been. It's people haven't brought it up to me. Um, but it's been something that I've been, I've watched happen. And um, it's, I would say it's the responsibility, like, you know, who's in charge. It's the responsibility of both people to, to take responsibility for what's being said and what's being, what's landing. And is there an agreement? 
the thing is, the way I look at it, the thing is, is that most people aren't taught how to communicate. And oftentimes, let's say somebody goes to your program or goes to my program, they've learned how to communicate a little bit more, but yet they're not, but they're speaking to somebody that hasn't learned that communication. So there's a, like, I'm right because you, you know, so in this example, you know, you brought me grapes and then immediately as you bring me grapes, I become right about, I don't like grapes and that you misunderstood me. And, and it becomes, so then immediately that curiosity that I love, well, whole thing's a curiosity theory, right? That I, I didn't, I didn't notice that, that I actually shut off my own curiosity. And it's really funny because the answer was right in front of me. So thank you for that. Um, and then, so it's listening to understand and then speaking so that you can be understood. And I would say in addition to that is I don't speak to have agreement. You know, there, that would be maybe another distinction to like consider as so my thought is I'm kind of rambling, um, it, but I'm just working through a thought. So thanks for hanging in with me. So let's say I'm a manager. So I'm a manager and somebody comes and I'm communicating something to them. I tell them something. And because I told them something, my expectation is that they're going to do the thing I told them, but I didn't create an agreement. I didn't, you know, figure out who's going to do what by when and how we're going to follow up. So I didn't even follow up in my own conversation. So, you know, what we, what we teach in the curiosity theory is, is, is the follow-up is that when you go into action, you need an accountability, which is who Martine does what X, Y, Z by when, by tomorrow. And how do we follow up? You send me a text and say, it's done. And if we don't have that, then it's just kind of like, well, I said something and you were expected to do it. Well, you were just telling me something. I was trying to be a good listener, right? Well, and it's it's interesting. It's hard to speak to be understood for the reasons that you're saying, because we all process things differently. Everybody yeah. has different perspectives, assumptions, lenses, what have you. So in that case, so when a manager says this is what needs to be done, right? Mm -hmm. And and even if you put those timelines in place, it still may not be done the way you want it. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. Sure. So that's where you can say that's where curiosity comes into play, because from your perspective, you thought you were probably or the manager thinks that they're being really clear on how what I'm they want, who, what, clear, where. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you and nodded. Person, <laughs> exactly. You're nodding. And the person doing the work probably has a very clear idea of how they want to do the work, but it might not be how their manager wants the work done. Yes. So when you get to that point, right? So then the work comes, it's the manager has not opportunity to say, okay, let's talk about whatever it is. Like, how did you decide to come to present the work or get to the end goal, whatever mm. it was? Tell me about your process. Yeah. They're going to learn how that person got through that process and why they chose to do it the way they did. Staying in that place of curiosity and asking those questions is going to help that person learn how to do it differently rather than just saying, that's not what I wanted. And that's or defending, wrong. right? That's defending. Or defending. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that humans get really stuck in this right, wrong mindset, right, wrong, good, bad, right? Like I'm right, you're wrong. And I'm a Latino man. We do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, the whole world is like that, yeah. right? Any family. You sit Bunch down of Latinos like, out there. I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But the world doesn't operate that way. There is yeah. a lot of gray area. And so it's shifting out of this right, wrong perspective, shifting out of blame and judgment to say, okay, walk me through, like help me understand mm, where you're coming love it. from. Perfect. Yeah. Because that's where you're going to bridge the gap. It's understanding the process. And that is where the learning takes place because you can have a lot of agreements without any meat involved yeah. in them and things yeah. still don't happen properly right so the more right. that you can ask those questions so you ensure that they're on the same page and it's everybody's responsibility i i believe that you know it's a leader's responsibility and, and it's the the corporation whatever business setting the tone so that employees feel comfortable asking questions because nine out of ten nine and a half nine point nine out of ten yeah. People don't feel comfortable asking questions. They don't want to ask how they want things done because they're too afraid. Yes. Right. So it's creating a culture where people feel really comfortable asking questions because that's how productivity, that's when good things happen, right? That's when you can really get to the heart of how are we going to get this done the right, the right way, our way, yeah. whatever way it needs to be, rather than going through that long process of, nope, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. 
But when you find out, I, I, I got goosebumps just thinking about what you were talking about, because when you find somebody that is actually curious, you know, and or when you're curious about somebody, they will just start asking away because there's oftentimes there's so much that they want to get out. So when you can create trust and safety and respect, when you can do, you know, understanding and what are the, what are the, what are the, in your book you said, I'm going to just take your title. So uh, collaboration, innovation, understanding, when you create that environment, it's just, it's, you just, people just want to play in it. Yeah. It's just so and fun to play in. Vulnerability is a big word that's used a lot yeah. right now. And people, they really want people to be vulnerable. I haven't met a person that wants to be vulnerable at work, right? Like, especially leaders, women don't like to be vulnerable at work. It's a really hard place for them to access. So for me, I always say, you just switch that word vulnerability with curiosity. You can't, Oh, you're wow. going to get the same result. It's like empathy. you got to go as long as you stay curious, right? You're going to end up in the same place. And it, it's a reframe that's really helpful for people because they can find power in curiosity, like literally, right? They're like, I can do that. I can be curious. Whereas that vulnerability piece is like, I'm not going to go there. But it ends up making people harder sometimes. Curiosity opens us up. Right. Yeah. So it's a it's a great reframe when you can think, OK, if I can stay in that place of curiosity, I'm going to end up with the same result. Oh, yeah. Christian, you rock, because it's so funny. I was going to when you're talking, starting to talk about vulnerability, I, I do. I have a men's course called Men's Breakthrough and I, I interview men every day. I interview by two or three men. And this conversation about vulnerability has been something that so many men have talked about. Is I'm supposed to be vulnerable, but, what, but I don't know how. And. Like I said, I'm just so close to it. I didn't think, well, be curious, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's so funny. It's it, it, it sometimes like the, you know, the truth is right there or the, or the answer is right there in front of you. Um, real quick, before we, before we finish up, I wanted to address something and ask you to explain something because I think this is like so powerful. I love this in your book. So in the book, you, you were talking about definitions. You were actually talking about identifying your values. Mm -hmm. So I'd like for you to share what, what, how you define values and then after that, how we um, how we actually operate with different definitions, like assuming that we actually are operating with the same definitions. And how do you go about that? Well, values for us are, we call them the GPS, like they are our GPS, right? So our values are kind of like our emotions. They're always there whether we're present, present to them or not. Mm -hmm. So they, they guide us. They tell us what's important to us in life. The thing about values is we don't take the time to discover them. We don't take the time to really understand them, but our values are also attached to our emotional triggers. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody who values time, anytime that somebody is late to a meeting, you're going to be frustrated and angry, right? Your emotional buttons are going to be pushed. Yeah. The thing that's funny about values though, too, is that a lot of people can share values, like, especially if you're talking, you know, family values. So a lot of, families assume that they have the same values, right? We all have the same value of say, I don't know, whatever it may be, love, trust, yeah. what have you. Yeah. How you define that though, is gonna be very different. So I was recently talking to somebody, I was talking to a parent and we were going through values and you know, she's like, well, health is a value. And I know my kids health is a value. And I said to her, okay, well, how your 17 year old defines health, I promise you is gonna be very different <laughs> than how you define <laughs> health, right? And that was what Absolutely. was causing the conflict. Yeah. But it's it's kind of like when you meet somebody and you're like, oh, I love adventure. And they say, I love adventure. Well, to one of them, it's jumping out of an airplane. And the other person, it's going to the movies. Well, every time you're at the movies, the person who wants to jump out of an airplane is going to be angry. And every time they take you to jump out of an airplane, they're going to be angry because they're not <laughs> at the movies, right? And That's you right. get into conflict. And yeah. you think that you said you loved adventure. Yes. How we define our values is so, 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 so important because it is different to everybody. There is no right or wrong way of defining your values. It's just how that value gives meaning to you. And the only thing that matters is that you understand what that means and that you mm. also understand then what it means for your partner and yes. you understand what it means for your kids. And if yeah. you're an employer, like an employee, a business owner, understanding what your values mean for you because you have to be able to hire and fire on them right yes so most of us don't go into the definition we just slap things up on the wall or we think that we attach to something and we never follow that through yeah. it is life-changing 
you 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 had a story that I think is going to be it's a really great case study um where there was a, a a sales team a leader of a sales team and he he seems like he thought he was communicating to everybody you know uh, that and everybody was on the same page but it turned out everybody wasn't on the same page and then he got upset and said I'm going to do it myself and you know and and that was that so can you tell a little bit of that story in the book if you, you mind really quick I honestly don't remember what that story okay. was so that's uh, okay. That's so. What, I, what what the point is? I think really is is that is that um in the story, there's a there's a a manager trying to meet a quota, and um oh, he's yes. believing that everybody's operating on the same values, but there was never an agreement. Yeah. Right. And wasn't it had to do with the budget where they were going to cut a whole bunch of money, and so he assumed where he was going to cut the money, and then went and talked to them and realized that yeah. It like, what are you what talking about? Yeah. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. That happens so often. I love it. Um, so wh what, uh, how can people, um, how can people get a hold of you? We can find it website, instituteofcuriosity.com. We give, join our mailing list. We give a ton away for free. We are all about that. We just love to empower people with, you know, tips and tricks and skills and strategies to have better conversations, to have curious conversations, and to help them in those hard and challenging conversations. We're also on Instagram. Wow, Kristen, I I, um, I love the book. I love what you're about. I am really grateful because you the insight that you gave me uh, to practice curiosity in places that I wasn't practicing, that I can see that I was, even though I teach curiosity, sometimes I need to like look at and apply it in different places. So really thank you for that. I'm I'm gonna definitely reflect on 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 our conversation the rest of the day today. Uh Kristen, I want to thank you so much. I just I I love what you're about. I love what you're doing. And um yeah, just keep it up and and you know if you guys need help with curiosity, I I or if you're stuck in a bind, Kristen's definitely somebody <laughs> to talk to. I absolutely do you coach? Do you do personal coaching and all that stuff? I do. Yeah, we do coaching. My mom and I both do coaching. She does a lot of um, emotional intelligence work. Mm. And and I love working with, with parents too, because, you know, these are the skills that we teach. We're teaching our kids. And parents are the least curious people with their kids. And it's not... <laughs> I, don't everything. That, I don't mean that in a blaming way. I just no, mean that in a jerk reaction, right? We want the best for our kids to protect them. And sometimes, to your point, the things that are closest to us we have those blinders on and it's hard for us to get out side of that. And our kids Absolutely. are very much that way. Well, thank you for stopping by the curiosity theory hangout. I I'm just really grateful. And, and uh, I just, I can't wait to just, you know, deepen our relationship and our, and support you in any way. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. I could talk to you for hours. I really I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Take care.